So the Merton portfolio theory looks a little different than the standard portfolio theory. Uh, to remind you of, of how it works, let's look back at the equations. We have a market timing component, and we have state variable hedging component. How much do those matter? Are, are you really that far off if you think in classical terms? Let me give you two simple examples to suggest my view of the world. It matters tremendously. The first example is let's look at the market timing component. Uh, and let's just think about investing in the stock market versus a risk-free rate. Really simple. The formula is weight is 1 over gamma, mean over variance. And let's think about the model of time-varying mean returns that we've had all along since the first day. A very simple model. I don't mean to say this is the most sophisticated model. It's the first one you write down. Returns are forecast by dividend price ratios. That means that the expected excess return is the fitted value of this regression. So A plus B D P is what you'd put on the top there. And this is a very simple version of what hedge funds do all the time. They run regressions to make models of mean returns. They put them in portfolio maximizers. And then they think about if they want to take the portfolio advice that come out of those portfolio maximizers. They just do much bigger regressions than, than we're going to run on the board here. <laughs> now, you already kind of know that this is going to be important. We learned that the variance of A plus DP, that the standard deviation of A plus DP is about 5%, whereas mean returns are about 7%. So this thing on the top is, is, is changing a lot over time, and so will the portfolio advice. I, I ran this regression, and I made the calculation just to emphasize uh, how big it is. That's shown in the graph here. Uh, the regression, a return 3.75 times DP with a variance of about 20%. So let's put that regression, those numbers, in this portfolio optimizer and see what it says about what weights we should be doing. Well, one way of expressing it is the portfolio weight should now depend on the dividend yield. You look at the dividend yield and, and do more or less on your portfolio. This is a graphical version as a function of DP ratio from 1 to, to, one to 7 is, is sort of the uh, one standard deviation range. I put that here. And it shows you for gamma 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 how much you should be varying your portfolio weights. And it's huge. For gamma equals 2, which we settled on, we go from minus 100 up to 250. So as dividend yields vary just by one standard deviation, you should be varying the Merton advice says vary your portfolio weights tremendously. Here it is over time. Uh, and for gamma equals 2, there's a blue line. That's what your portfolio should have been. Your allocation to stocks should have been 100 to 250 to 100 to minus 50 to 0 to negative and so forth. The Merton model prescribes a huge variation in, in, uh, in, in the weights. Now, is that trustworthy? Uh, lots of these models are overfit. They're numerically unstable, so this isn't uh, the statement that that's what you should go out and do. But nonetheless, it's suggestive that in classic setups, the market timing components are big and worth thinking about. That people kind of have a handle on. That's what hedge funds are doing. The hedging is more overlooked. Is hedging demands important? Uh, well, let's look at an example. And the example is one that we've been carrying around all along. How about long-term bonds? Where do we put long-term bonds in our portfolio analysis? From a mean variance perspective, from a one period mean variance perspective, long term bonds look awful. Long term bonds have about the same variance of stocks, a mean maybe 1% more than short term bonds. They just look like terrible assets. But remember, long term bonds from the perspective of a long term investor, somebody who cares about uh, 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 consumption out at that period there, that is the perfectly risk free asset. Long term bonds are a great investment for a long term investor. Why? Because no matter what happens in the short run, no matter what happens tomorrow, all this variance for not much mean, every time the bond loses money, every time you lose money today, the expected return tomorrow goes up. Long-term bonds have a huge covariance with the state variable for their investment opportunities. When the price goes down, the yield goes up. That means when we put them in the Merton model, they have a very big hedging demand. And that hedging demand explains why they're a good asset for long-term investors. If you ignore the hedging demand, you get exactly the wrong answer. From a mean variance perspective, it says, put your money in, the, in cash, get out of long-term bonds. The hedging demand says, put all your money. If, if you're a risk-free, if very risk-averse investor, it says, put your money in the long-term bonds, not the short-term bonds. 
So you get exactly the wrong answer if you ignore the hedging demands. That's a sense that hedging demands are very important. And so maybe we ought to be uh, take, putting, paying a little more attention to the Merton model. Thank you.